Well, hard fans, hang on a second. Before we get going, today's video is brought to you by the great, amazing folks at NordVPN. I'm so excited. In fact, I came all the way into the internet to talk about this amazing company. In fact, this that's right, this is the internet. You didn't think it looked like this, did you? But this is what it looks like. That's right, look, over there, that is information. Pretty amazing. VPN is a virtual private network. That's right, you get a private network to protect all of your very, very valuable data. That's right, when you're in a coffee shop or in an airport, places where your data is subject to like, you know, hackers and bad people like this guy, like, Hi. Nay, no, out, go. Bad. You're I, bad internet guy, go. There you go, thank you. Okay, here's some really cool things about NordVPN. They offer super fast servers, 5,500 of them in 60 countries. NordVPN also offers up to six simultaneous connections. You can unlock Netflix and your favorite entertainment websites. Okay, let's say you're in England and you're traveling over there and you wanna watch Tiger King and you're like, where is it? Why can't I get it? NordVPN will allow you to, from England, access the American version of Netflix. Netflix and watch Tiger King in England. And over there, when your English friends say, have you watched anything good lately? You can say, as a matter of fact, I haven't watched Tiger King. They'll say, oh, what's up? We haven't seen that over here. And you can say, it's a show on Netflix. I watch it because I have NordVPN. And they'll say, wow, you're really amazing. I want to be like you. Also with this offer, you get a 30 day money back guarantee. Look how much I'm moving my hands. So hey guys, listen, NordVPN is awesome. They're offering an amazing deal to you guys. Okay, just go to nordvpn.com forward slash heartfan. That's right, use the code heartfan and you will get is it 20% off? 70% off. No, wait. Stop it. Seven. Oh, I'm back. 70. 70% is a lot. You guys get 70% off NordVPN. That's only $349 a month. Is it $349 a month? That is exactly $349 a month. Wow. You know why I'm smarter? Because I'm in the internet. Go to nordvpn.com forward slash heartfan. Get 70. Still can't believe it. 70% off. $349 a month. You guys will love it. NordVPN. Thank you so much for sponsoring this video. And guys, go check them out. They rock. I'm leaving the internet now. Here I go. Hey, art fans. Butch Hartman here. Thank you so much for tuning in. Don't forget to like it. What is, whoa, what is, what, Mr. Cameraman, what is that? Oh, that's my pet wasp, Wally. Wally, but a wasp in here, really? As, uh, you know. I couldn't take care of him at home today, so I had to bring him with me. All right, fine, just keep him over there. He looks very, very dangerous. Okay, so don't forget to like and subscribe. If you guys want a commission for me, like a drawing that I do for you, click the link down below. Okay, whoa. Um, okay, look, this, I'm fine if he's here. Does he have to be in this room, though? Uh, I mean, I have to keep an eye on him. I can't let him do whatever he wants. Well, somebody's going to hurt him? Who's gonna hurt that? Who's gonna I, hurt that? I'm more afraid of the other way around. Uh, yeah, yeah, just don't. Okay, look, he's, he, stay Wally over there, thank you. All right guys, listen, I have a segment on my show right now, we're doing it right now, it's called Tuna, T-O-O-N-A, where I interview people from all across the entertainment spectrum, from the world of movies, TV, music, animation, video games, YouTube. Today I've got an amazing YouTuber on. I'm so excited this guy uh, decided to come on today. It's, it's a real honor. His name is Coyote Peterson. If you haven't seen his channel, please go watch it. You have to. Um, this guy is a is he's like he's like the crocodile hunter meets Indiana Jones on steroids times 12. This guy gets stung by bullet ants, number one, tarantula hawks. Uh, executioner wasps, all the names sound horrible, that's enough for me. He puts them on his body and you'll see what he does. But anyway guys, hey, I, I'm so glad he's here. All right guys, let's go right now to our interview with our good friend, before Wally comes back, Coyote Peterson. All right, I got, I got the recording going. That's the number one thing I got going, that's good. I have the amazing Coyote Peterson. Dude, how are you? I'm good, thank you so much for having me on the show today. Man, you know, I, I have to be honest with you. I, I just recently found out who you were, and I, you know, because my my uh, gentleman here works with me, uh, he's a young interview Coyote Peterson. I'm like, I don't know who Coyote Peterson is, and I'm so sorry, but I started watching your stuff. Now I'm totally addicted, man. I, I've seen like a ton of dude. I, I just got to give you, a, I'm, I'm applauding right now. I can't, this is, a, I'm going to turn this into a huge round of applause. I cannot believe what I see you do. It is unbelievable. I do do some pretty crazy stuff. If, if people don't know me by name and you say, oh, that guy that got stung by a bullet ant or bitten by a snapping turtle on an alligator, you're like, oh, yeah, that guy, the guy that's like kind of Indiana Jones meets <laughs> crocodile hunter meets yeah. who knows what. Yeah, then you're like, oh, yeah, that guy. That's the guy. Well, dude, yeah. let's, let's, let's talk about you. This is so good. Uh, the most painful thing I've ever encountered are some of my drawings. My drawings look really bad sometimes. That's like as painful as I get. But yeah. dude, I've got a list here. I'm just going to go down the list of things you've been stung by. First, let, let, let's do that in a sec. But where are you from originally? Where, where were you born? 
Uh, so I grew up in a very tiny town called Newberry, Ohio. I live now in Columbus, Ohio, where I've spent about half my life. So for those who don't know Newberry, Newberry is about 40 miles southeast of Cleveland. Okay. Uh, very rural part, still is insanely rural today. I mean, so rural that there's no McDonald's, no Starbucks. So it's a pretty little blip on the map, but it was the perfect place to grow up, especially if you were honing the uh, skill of getting up close and personal with animals, different creepy crawlies and reptiles and amphibians, lots of those in my backyard. So you had a love for these things long before YouTube. This isn't something you just took on like, what can I do for YouTube? I know, but you actually liked this stuff beforehand, right? Oh yeah. I mean, animals pretty much define who I am from the age three years old on. I was out exploring, trying to catch frogs and turtles and stuff like that. And really the way that it all came full circle into YouTube without necessarily too quickly diving into it. Um, my, my background's in, in story writing, producing, directing, um, and I sort of combined both worlds of entertainment and the love for animals into one thing that then became YouTube and a television show and all the other stuff we create. Okay, so so when you say you wrote entertainment, what did you work on? Did you work on some reality shows or something like that? Or did you work on- No, like, uh, in, college, in, in college, I developed a, a screenwriting project and produced and directed my first feature film in college. Uh, and then beyond that, I actually wrote a handful of screenplays. I've got you know the typical boohoo Hollywood story where you get real close to landing a independent film deal, $5 million picture that fell apart in the really the contractual stages. And right around the time that was happening, I also caught this really large snapping turtle, which I hadn't caught snapping turtles in years, showed the picture to the producers I was working with at the time. And they were like, whoa, <laughs> this isn't screenwriting. This isn't directing. How in the world did you know how to catch whatever this gargantuan reptile is? Oh. Uh, and I, I sort of told them about it. And they said, well, we got to make an animal show. Why are you trying to write screenplays when you should do an animal show? And I was like, ah, I don't really know that's for me. I never wanted to be in front of a camera. And, you know, long story short, here we are 10 years later, and uh, it seems to work out all right, I guess. Unbelievable. So you've been on YouTube for 10 years. No, our YouTube channel is, is actually just about to turn six years old in September. So there was four years before that where we were developing concepts uh, designing television pitches, shooting sizzle reels, mm -hmm. pretty much having every network on the face of the planet tell us, no, animal shows just don't work anymore. And then we ended up launching the YouTube channel and the whole thing really skyrocketed. So Smart. very thankful for the, the YouTube platform, which I'm sure is, as you know, and, and how we're now distributing this piece of content, a lot of eyeballs on YouTube, which is an awesome thing. No, it, it truly is amazing. It's, it's a real free, there's a real freedom to it as well. Of course, there's mm -hmm. There's also a kind of a Wild West mentality where anyone can, you know, uh, there's really no rules. If, if somebody wants to say something or do something that's maybe not favorable, that's not fun either. But right. it's still, if you just if you just do something that's fun and you're trying to lift people up and have a great time, I think it's a great place to go. And you yeah. and, and you know and you can make a great living out of it, which is awesome. Yeah. Well, certainly for any of your viewers, I say the same thing to our audience. You know, there's a lot of aspiring screenwriters or animators or adventurers, no matter what your field is, if it, if it has the element of entertainment in it, right? If you want to produce content, YouTube gives you that platform to uh, have a, a distribution network. And that's usually the most difficult thing that any creative can find is a way to distribute their art forms. So now with the ability, like there isn't a cell phone on the planet that doesn't have a camera that's at least decent enough mm -hmm. to upload to YouTube. Anybody can be a, a video creator these days. That's not to say that all video creation is equal. Mm -hmm. Some stuff's going to be better than others, but it gives you this platform to try and practice. And I think that's what's so positive about it. Very cool. I, 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 that's great advice. And I always, I'm glad you got into that because I like to tell people, hey, listen, it's not easy. Everyone starts at zero. Everyone starts with zero subscribers, but if you're into it and you, because you guys must work really hard. How many videos do you put out a week? Is it a week or a month? How many, what, what would you say? Uh, right now we're putting out two videos a week. So there was a point in time where we were releasing three videos a week. Then in 2019, we produced a, a massive television series for Animal Planet. So that sort of for, forced us to go back down to one video a week. So balancing making a TV show plus also putting out one video a week on YouTube was a very challenging year in 2019. Um, right now, amidst all the coronavirus stuff, a lot of entertainment is sort of on a pause at the moment for stuff that's being produced. So 
we finished our first season of television and all of this year we're putting our focus back into YouTube. So we're back to two videos a week right now. Very cool. And it, it's very, very labor intensive. We're doing three videos a week now, still mm -hmm. labor intensive. And I, I don't do anything near what you do. I'm in a studio most of the time. You're out, you're out actually on location. Right. Your stuff is so professional though. I, mean, I was watching it. I feel like I'm watching an episode of, of Animal Planet or, or something that's on like Nat Geo or something. The music's mm -hmm. great. Your title sequence is great. Um, I got to ask, okay, I've got a list. Now. I'm going to go to the list of, yeah. of, of the list of pain, as I will call it, the list of pain. Yeah. So what made you decide that you wanted to get stung and bit by stuff? I mean, you know, it gets views, but like, what would, did you get, did you get bit accidentally and put it out? Or was it like, was that the plan from the beginning? Well, that's, that's a great question. And it's, it's an answer that people always want to know, you know, is Coyote just a masochist who enjoys pain? Like, is there some deep inner rooted struggles he's facing? And this is his way to release the aggression without ever saying a swear word. And the one thing that I, I always sort of start this answer with is, I'll say that as an animal presenter, I'm actually really good at not being bitten and stung by things. Like if you're constantly accidentally getting bitten and stung, you're not really doing a very good <laughs> job at your job. You know, you're, you're putting yourself into dangerous scenarios and you're not walking away with them with all your fingers. You've, right. you've gone wrong somewhere. But we, we did a video back in 2014 before we ever launched the channel with a porcupine. And we were working with the wildlife sanctuary in Montana, and we were there specifically to film with a couple of other different species, a grizzly bear and a badger and a pine marten. And they said, we just rescued this baby porcupine. It's super cute. You guys want to film it as well? And we said, yeah, sure. That sounds awesome. And I'd seen porcupines in the wild from a distance before. I'd never interacted with one. And when the um, animal handlers brought the porcupine out, we brought it out onto location so it was a very natural setting. They were removing it from its little carrying crate with these like leather gloves that came up to like the elbows. And I was like, whoa, whoa, wait, you guys are wearing leather gloves. How am I supposed to interact with this thing? And they're like, well, every time we get near it, we end up, you know, accidentally getting quilled. And then we start having this conversation about getting quilled and pets getting quilled and nobody really knowing the right way to remove those quills. And there being all these misnomers about the quill shooting and not shooting. And my gears started turning and I was like, man, well, what if we did an episode with this cute porcupine about what to do if you get quilled? And they're like, I mean, if you want to get yourself quilled, go for it. And we ended up doing that because obviously we wouldn't be like, well, let's bring a dog in and get the dog quilled to show you how to remove them. So we're like, well, let's make me the experiment. We did it. And, and lo and behold, I mean, the episode was a train wreck um, from the production and post-production side because in production, we filmed it in the forest and we had all these crazy light beams coming through, which caused all sorts of problems for the camera and the exposure. Uh, yep. It looks like garbage. And then in post-production, we're looking at it, we're like, man, like there's these problems and these problems. Are people gonna really like that I go through this pain? And at one point my hand had like seized up because some of the quills had hit a nerve. We're like, well, let's just cut it together and put it out and see what the audience thinks. And then it was a landslide. I mean, oh, it was like our most popular video ever. Oh. And then slowly the stings and the bites started coming into it. And we looked at it as like, okay, if we can get people really excited about these really bizarre animals, many of which they're probably afraid of, make me the experimental guinea pig and educate them while giving them that extreme entertainment, it worked. So oh, dude, that's that is so intense. And like um I, I so what we came after the what came after the porcupine was, was it a bug right away or was it just another animal like a, like a like a land mammal? Uh, the next one was me getting bitten by an alligator snapping turtle, and that one was really sort of a joke that we were doing an episode on alligator snapping turtles, <sighs> and I posted a photo on Instagram being like, "Hey, we call our audience the Coyote Pack. Hey, Coyote Pack, do you guys want to see what it would be like for a snapping turtle to bite my arm?" And like the response was like <laughs> insane. With people being like, yes, do it. Or we thought they'd be like, no, 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 dude, that's crazy. Don't do it. We ended up filming that video. We, we quickly constructed a, a way to show the power of a snapping turtle biting a turkey leg, then building a brace on my arm so that it wouldn't do the amount of damage to my arm that it did to the turkey leg. That then led to the stings. And then we sort of de devised these two different categories, bite episodes sting episodes and they both sort of follow this different tier of reasoning and mm. science and all this stuff mm. so okay so let's go down the list here the toe biter yeah the toe biter where 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 what part of the world do you find the toe biter toe biters believe it or not are found in pretty much 
every part of the world. So giant water bugs have a variety of different species within their genre. The one that we filmed with specifically was in Costa Rica, but you can find them all across the United States from the Pacific Northwest down to Florida. Um, it's technically a bite, not a sting. They have something in the front of their mouth, uh, a rostrum and a proboscis that uh. shoots out to impale their victim after they've latched onto it. And they'll- I met, I met a Hollywood executive with the exact same thing once. I met- <laughs> <laughs> Yes, probably several of them. <laughs> and they will inject this saliva that has these enzymes that will essentially break down the insides of their victims. So if you're a tadpole, a fish, a baby turtle, it basically melts your insides and then turns you into like a real coarse slushy that they then drink up and then just dispose of the rest of your carcass. I met a girl that did that to me once. I, I, I'm <laughs> telling you, I dated a girl. All right, so, okay. I have a funny story about the tarantula hawk. I know that's a funny okay. story. But I remember like, it was like 2002, I'm pulling up my driveway and there's this black shape pulling another black shape. Yeah. And I get up, I'd never seen this before, but it was a bug with orange wings and it was pulling a tarantula. And go ahead, so tell us what the tarantula hawk does. I was a tarantula, I call it a tarantula wasp at the time, it was a tarantula hawk, right? Yeah, well, it is technically a wasp. It's the largest wasp species in the United States, but uh, they're all technically spider wasps. And the tarantula hawk is called such because they will fly around and hawk, like a hawk will look with its vision. They'll be able to sense where a tarantula's burrow is. They'll tempt that tarantula out of its burrow and they sting it, paralyze it, drag it back down into its own burrow. So the tarantula takes the tarantula into its house, lays an egg on top of it. The tarantula is in a state of paralysis, still alive. So this is like a true horror film. It is a horror film. When that larva hatches, it burrows through the exoskeleton, eats the tarantula's insides, kills it, grows up out of it like an alien, (laughs) flies away, the process repeats. Crazy, right? And you're welcome, Earth. You're welcome. Yeah. Hey, but so, dude, you got so I when I that was the first video I watched of yours. I couldn't Mm -hmm. believe I couldn't believe it. What how long were the effects of the sting? How long did it last? I I mean, I guess I want to ask you. How long did that, I mean, any sting, what's the longest something is like, the tarantula hawk sting, for example, how long did that last? Tarantula hawk, actually, so on the insect sting pain index, which is created by this brilliant entomologist named Justin Schmidt based out of uh, Tucson, Arizona, he ranks everything on a scale of one to four. So all of my, you know, experimentation is based on his original insect sting pain index. So there's a handful of insects that rank as a four. Uh, Execution wasp, giant hornet, bullet ant, uh, tarantula hawk and warrior wasp. So the Ooh. tarantula hawk is, you know, up there in that top realm, but the sting's pain, like that intense electrical paralysis mm. to a human only lasts for about five to seven minutes. Okay. So it's bad. Um, what's so terrifying about the tarantula hawk is its <laughs> size. That's the thing that I think for most people, when they watch that video, they're just like, no way. No, I mean, no, you, think really about, yeah. you think about like a normal hornet or a bee being, you know, less than an inch. It scares like you enough. That hawk. scares enough people. Yes, exactly. Yeah, the tarantula hawk from, from like the tip of its mandibles to like the end of its abdomen can be close to four inches in length. So it's a big, it's a big a little, creature. A little, a little, you know, cell, we're talking cell phone here. Oh my gosh. It's, it's, it's super intimidating. And the one that, that I had caught was, was a big one. So it's really important to note that the males and females are very different. And it's only the females that can sting. And it's the females that get larger than the males. So the one that you saw in your driveway, definitely a female. The one that I was stung by, definitely a female. Um, and it's pretty intense. You don't ever want to get stung by it. That's for sure. I, that's, well, I've learned that for sure, dude. And by the way, I'm sweating now as I'm talking to you. And I was sweating when I watched the video. It was, it was, yeah. uh, it was you deserve all the views. It was amazing. Um, I had, uh, the, I got another, the executioner wasp. Did that hurt as much as the tarantula, uh, tarantula hawk? So what's worse about the executioner wasp, and again, we broke our science down a little bit differently than Justin did because we also looked at the execution wasp as being an insect that creates a nest and a swarm. A tarantula hawk is a singular insect. They don't move together in swarm, so you're never gonna get stung by more than one. But if you're in the mountains of Costa Rica and you disturb a nest of executioner wasps, Mm. that is the largest vespid wasp in the 
New World. Uh-huh. It also has the most toxic venom, which means that the proteins and peptides that make up its venom have a necrotic component to them, which it actually rotted a hole in my arm. Like, so you know, if like you, if like you're younger, you get acne really bad. You get like those pock marks yes. in your your skin. Yeah, that is essentially what this sting did to my arm. But imagine that like times two. So there was like a divot in my arm. It looked like somebody took like a, you know, like a hole puncher. Looks like somebody took my skin, my forearm and punched a hole in it. That's what the venom did. Cooked out a hole in my arm, basically. Dude. And how, how long did that last with the effects of that? So that the effects, the after effects of that lasted for almost four weeks because it it was the, the pain, the swelling the after effects of the venom and then like this insane itching that would like swell up like twice a day. It was really weird. Like twice a day, there'd be this after effect of like insane itching, like the worst poison ivy ever. And it would swell and the welt would increase. So we, we didn't, we, the thing was that I wish I would have done differently with a lot of those videos is documenting the process the weeks after in more detail on video. Cause we kind of didn't like we shot some photographs, but when we were doing it all, we had no idea that they would be so successful when, once they really started going. So like with the bullet ant, the tarantula hawk, like a lot of very similar effects to all of them, but the execution loss was definitely the worst. Mm, dude, unbelievable. Um, you went into a death cage in Australia. Mm-hmm. Am I correct? And, and what, was there, what was swarming around the death cage? I'm assuming you're talking about the saltwater crocodile. Yeah, right? that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. The, the, yeah. <laughs> so what was awesome about that is so crocodile. The, the, the is, crocodile and alligator and executioner give me the willies a little bit. So I'm just saying. Yeah, well, saltwater crocodile should. I'll tell you. Well, when we were filming the first season of Brave the Wild, our series for Animal Planet, one of the episodes is about saltwater crocodiles versus freshwater crocodiles. And the fact that the two are very often confused in Australia. Salties are very aggressive. Freshies are not. We went out and filmed saltwater crocodiles in the wild, but then we visited the Crocosaurus Cove and did this video for YouTube to get some underwater shots of them. But what's crazy is that like, just like a horror scene out of Jaws, they put you in this clear tube and lower you down into the water so that the crocodiles can swarm around you. And then they feed them from the surface and they're like jumping up. And I mean, some of these crocodiles, the head is long enough to fit your entire upper body as a human in it. Like, it's a serious dinosaur. Mm-mm-mm. I And I and crocodiles are way bigger than alligators, but alligators aren't to be messed with either. You don't want to mess with either yeah. one of them. Yeah. Well, the, the saltwater crocodile is so dangerous because they're so fearless around humans. And a saltwater crocodile won't attack you, bite you, maybe shake you and let go. It's going to bite you, shake you, hold on drown you and rip you apart so that's yeah. why they're so dangerous oh my gosh dude okay so wait so and now let's go to the the i just watched the bullet ant right before i got on right okay. before i got on here so the bullet ants that's the ant in indiana jones and the crystal skull right is that what they're is that what that the was that the ant they were afraid of in that movie Do you remember that movie yeah I, you know to be honest with you i'm not sure if those were bullet ants or not there were so many cg questionings in my mind as a big Spielberg fan in that movie. Right, 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 <laughs> I'll have to go right. back and revisit it. But they were only seen it once. No, I know. I say it with me, but they were terrified of this species of ant. And I'm wondering, because the bullet ant, how big is a bullet ant? Big as your thumb? Uh it's yeah. So there there the thing to note is that there are different types of bullet ants within a nest. Uh-huh. And the most aggressive ones are the soldiers that guard the opening. Right. There's also a queen. There's also foragers. So the foragers are actually a little bit bigger and you'll see them way away from the nest, wandering to find new spots to build nests, mm-hmm. not quite as aggressive. Um, but yeah, to, to answer your question specifically, they can grow to about an, an inch or a little bit more in length. Wow, dude. And so, so the bullet ant, it's, I just watched that one. It seems like that was the most painful one. Was that the most painful thing? It, it was in 2016, but since then, um, it's tied with the warrior wasp, which was rumored to be more painful than the bullet ant, which is said is not more painful, but more dangerous because again, they have wings and they can fly where ants are just on the ground. But then the the Japanese giant hornet and the execution wasp definitely both took the bullet ant down as being the most painful sting in the world. Dude, unbelievable. And these are animals that don't die after they sting you. They sting and they keep their stinger, correct? They do. But it's important to note with the, the sting of any insect that 
there's only so much venom that can be injected from multiple stings, right? So let's say a bullet ant stings you. It's that first sting, that first moment of aggression that is the most potent venom. Because if uh, it, like, like, let's say you catch an ant and you're harassing it, you're poking it and it's stinging and stinging. It's exuding that venom as it's pushing out that stinger. So when we caught that first ant or anytime we catch one of these bugs, we try to be as calm as possible because we want that venom to be potent when it goes into me, you know, <laughs> dare I say that, but we want the full effect. So wow, after it stings you, yes, they do keep their stinger, but the more it stings you, the less potent that venom becomes because that venom's kept in a sack and it depletes. And then that insect needs to go out and continue eating and restoring that venom supply to use as an attack again. Remember, all these insects don't use those stingers to kill prey items. They use them as defense. So it's kind of like a super powered like rocket launcher. You want all that power to be in the first sting. After that, you're relying on your buddies to also magnitude you with stings. So does that make sense? I totally, totally make sense. Again, yeah. I'm, I'm just glad I'm a cartoonist and I sit in the chair and draw all day. I'm just very glad. <laughs> yeah. Maybe I get stung by my pen. I'll see what that does. Hey, let me ask you a question. Paper cuts can be just as bad. I'm just yeah, saying. I got, <laughs> you, I got a question. What is, what's, the ultimate for you have you reached the ultimate yet is there something out there you haven't done like some animal you haven't encountered yet um well recently recently we just launched um the two most recent videos that we released um have to do with snake venom milking and a video that just came out on saturday was what happens when you mix snake venom with human blood and not inject it into my arm but we drew vials of blood from my body and mixed venom and the popularity of what we've got going with these venom experiments right now is is very intriguing. Is there we've a chemical a couple, reaction that happens? Like you see, is there a chemical reaction that happens with the venom and the blood? Oh, wow. So we're very strategic in the way that we release things on the channel because we want to build up anticipation with the audience. This is what we did with bite episodes and with the sting episodes. So now that we figured this out with the venom concept, um, we've got a couple more in the works. So this first experiment was very crude. The next time around with the, the next series of snakes we're milking, we are introducing the microscopic levels. So you'll be able to see what is happening to the blood cells as the venom is attacking it, which will be really exciting. But the, the penultimate in this venom series that we're building up to is making actually the first like brave wilderness movie that will be in the YouTube space, which is this huge, huge expedition we've been working on to go to Komodo Island, extract venom from a Komodo dragon and mix that with human blood. So that's not gonna happen. This Venom series will conclude at the end of 2021, and it has officially started launching like within these past two weeks, so. Very cool. So I didn't know Komodo yeah. dragons had venom. They have venom? It has been discovered that Komodo dragons are in fact venomous. Their venom is very slow reacting, but no one's ever done an experiment like this. So we'll be some of the first, hopefully, to wow. be able to film these dragons in the wild, find a way to safely extract venom from the scenario, mix that with human blood and, and show you what, what happens and whether it's, it's really microscopically interesting or just a crude experiment, people are certainly interested in seeing what would happen when you mix my blood with venom. Wow, dude, that is amazing. And I'm just picturing like uh, Coyote Peterson zombies walking around or something. I just, <laughs> when you mix blood and snake, snake blood. Dude, this is just so cool. There's a million other animals I could ask you about. I know you got to get going, but like the Gila monster, last one. We'll go to the Gila monster. How was mm -hmm. that one? Where, 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 what kind of Gila monster was it? Where was it from? So there are two venomous lizards in the new world. One is the Gila monster, the only venomous lizard in the United States. The other is the bearded lizard or the beaded lizard, which lives in Mexico. I was bitten by the Gila monster and it was an accidental bite. So I would never have intentionally gotten bitten by a Gila monster or a rattlesnake or some of these things that are really, really, really dangerous. Um, but I was accidentally bitten by getting a GoPro camera too close to the lizard's face. And that is the most painful bite I've ever taken. So the lizard latched onto my thumb oh. for all of a second. I literally ripped my finger out of its mouth. And in just that amount of time, it got enough venom into me that I could feel the venom go all the way up my arm into my chest. Mm. And it was like the most insane pain you can imagine for about six and a half to seven hours. I mean, so bad that by the point it was at my, my middle of my forearm, I was like, it may be less painful 
to cut off my arm than oh, to keep dude. experiencing what this is. I okay, now is that is that someone like me gets bitten by a heel monster? Do I go to the hospital instantaneously, or do I just ride it out like you do? You're you're a total stud. I am not. What do I do? <laughs> what do I do? Well, we we were pretty. My my team and I were pretty nervous when I was bitten because there's no anti venom for heal a monster bites, right? So if you were bitten, 100%, I would say go seek medical attention just because you don't know how your body's going to react. Right. And it's all about whether or not your body has an allergic reaction to the venom. Now, we could see after 15 minutes that I wasn't having an allergic reaction. We spoke with a couple of venom experts, a couple of reptile experts, and the first thing they said was like, dude, Coyote, how did you get bitten by a heal monster? <laughs> These are the, You have to be an idiot to get bitten, which... I was because I got the camera too close, but they said, look, monitor your vi vital signs. If you feel like you're having an allergic reaction, go seek medical attention. But other than that, like, dude, you're tough, ride out the pain. And it was intense. I mean, it was really intense to ride out that pain for that amount of time. So to answer your question, if you were bitten by one, it's all subjective pain is. So you may have a super high pain tolerance. I would definitely say seek medical attention, but they're going to tell you, look, we'll give you some painkillers and rest and your body should be able to fight it off. But that's not always the case for everybody. So wow. um, venoms are very serious things, whether they're bites or stings. And the thing that I always say to my audience and certainly to your audience, never experiment with any of these things like I've done. For some really reason, I'm really resilient towards them. I don't know why, but I am and it works. You're a super, you should fight crime. I'm telling you, I really think. <laughs> I, 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 one last thing. I saw a guy on, a, on one of those shows. He got stung by a platypus. Yes. And they, they, they have uh, poisonous spurs in the back of their, mm -hmm. I mean, was everything in Australia is, is poisonous or something, but he got hit by a platypus. They had to give him a, um, an epidural to block the pain. It was yeah. No, the, I, I will not likely ever be like barbed by a platypus. Um, you got to really make him angry for that to happen. And yeah, I've, I've heard that the pain is just next level. Like you have to go to the hospital for that for sure. So we're going to, well, maybe on the next time we talk, maybe we'll uh, see, maybe we'll get a, a stuffed animal stung by a platypus or something. I don't know what yeah. it will be. Dude, it's been a pleasure talking to you, Coyote. Thank you so much, man. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me on the show today. You got it. And, um, oh, do you have any questions for me? I don't know if, I, I, what I do is very boring compared to what you do, but if, if, any questions at all? I mean, I, I do, because I feel like this went by so fast. I have so many questions about animation because I love the world of animation unlike anything else. I mean, one day I hope that we eventually turn Brave Wilderness and the Coyote Peterson character into an animated being at some point. You know, that would be like a dream come true for me. But yeah, I mean, I have a, I have a million questions. I mean, I guess we could keep going if you still got time, unless we want to do another one of these. Oh, I got time. If you want, you know, you, let's keep it going. If you got a question for me. Uh, yeah, happy, let's, let's keep happy. it going. I, I know the, the bites and stings definitely can, can go on forever. But, yeah. you know, with the, anim the animation process, I mean, how how did you get started in that? Like, when did you wake up and say, okay, I, I love doing doodling, but how do I take this to the next level? I mean, I'm sure just like with filmmaking or video creation, like, you've got to start somewhere. So for you, where did it really begin? Oh, that's a very good question. Yeah, I, I was a kid. I, I grew up in Michigan. I'm not too far from you. You're in the Midwest. And I grew up in Michigan yep. in the snow. But I grew up, I'm a little older than you. I grew up in the 70s. Uh, we had television, we had no VCRs, nothing, but I, I was very, I wasn't into sports, I was very into drawing, so I just started drawing. And as a little kid, I would, I was actually okay as an artist, but I would get attention from adults. Like adults would think, oh, he draws so well. So I thought, oh, I can get attention from adults. I started drawing more. Um, <clears throat> but I loved Fred Flintstone, I loved the Disney cartoons and all that kind of thing. So really wanted to do it. As I got older, getting out of high school, I thought, how am I going to do this for a living? And then a friend of mine from Michigan, of all things, was going to a school in California called CalArts, which is an art mm -hmm. school, and it's founded by Walt Disney. And they teach animation. And I thought, you know, I'm going to go to California. No one in my family had ever been to California before, even or moved there. I decided to move to California. I went to CalArts for three years, and I hung out. I just immersed myself in the world of animation with other nerds, basically. And we, I just talked it for 24 hours. We ended up getting – the whole goal about being in the school was getting a job after school. So we all – we all went out and did different jobs in the industry after that. Um, I learned every aspect of animation as I went. But it wasn't just about the drawing part. Artists are amazing, and I totally respect artists. But if you can become an artist and a writer at the same time, so I, become, I became a writer as well. I started writing my own stories because I would be working on these cartoons, and I wasn't happy with the writing. I thought, oh, this script isn't very funny, or this could be funny, or I would add jokes. And so I wanted to write my own stuff. 
And so I just started writing my own stuff. No one ever saw it. It was terrible. But it taught me how to be a storyteller. And I tell people all the time that they're not just artists, they're storytellers as well. Mm -hmm. Everything we do is storytelling. So I just tell my stories through animation. But I love creating characters. To this day, I'm in my 50s. I, I draw every day. I write every day. I'm coming up with new stuff every day. You know, and... Um, you know, so seeing extreme people like you just excites me. I'm like, this is really cool. What a great story that is, you know? So storytelling is key. So I, I did, since I was a kid, that was a very long answer. Sorry about that. Oh, no, that's that's perfect. I mean, I think the, the root of that is the storytelling, right? So a lot of stuff that we do with the content that we create, I think one thing that a lot of people don't know about me, I, they know I take the bites and the stings and we, we try to focus as much as we can on education conservation, but I do all the writing for the episode. So everything that you see on camera is me improving in the field and having no facts about animals, but all the stories surrounding it, all the voiceover is my favorite part to write those stories. Um, I'm real big into a guy named Joseph Campbell. I don't know if you've read any of, of his works, Hero with a Thousand Faces, with the concept of the hero's journey, mm -hmm. which is actually a lot of the stuff that George Lucas read before he wrote Star Wars. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I grew up on Star Wars, Ninja Turtles, Jurassic Park. Mm -hmm. And the thing that always drew me into all of those stories was the story itself. I wanted to know how you got from point A to point Z and kept that story arc going the entire time so that you could keep your, your audience member essentially glued to that storyline. And I'm sure, you know, just like making a video for you with, you know, the, the seasons and seasons of cartoons you did, how challenging was it to create season after season where you had these storylines that intricately connected together in, in not all instances, but, but really created that, anthology of, of work that you now call your library yeah well that's a good question too you know I, I look at it like this if you can create a great character you have endless amounts of material for that character mm -hmm. so like you know when we were able to, when i was able to do fairly odd parents we we they even asked me at the beginning you want to spend all your money on artwork and i said no i want to spend it all on storytelling they're like what yeah. we never heard that before don't you want it to look good i'm like well of course i want it to look good but if, if the story isn't interesting, no one's going to watch this cartoon. And as a result, Fairly Odd Parents ran for 17 years on Nickelodeon. You know, it was one of the biggest cartoons they ever had. Um, mm -hmm. I'm very fortunate and very grateful for all of that. But I always point to the show The Office. I go, you ever see The Office? You've seen The Office, right? Yep. Great, well, great seen it hysteric, hysterical show. But it's, it's, it's the most boring environment of all time. It takes place in an office. But the characters are so funny. You will watch Michael Scott do anything you know, you watch him in any scenario because he's a right. funny character. So if you create a funny character, you can do anything. So, uh, and you'll see every movie that you like, every um, TV show, if it's got a strong character, even like John Wick, for example, John Wick, mm -hmm. after a while, you probably get tired of the fighting, but for some reason you like that John Wick character, you know, you like the way yeah. he fights, you know, what is it? And by what does Keanu Reeves have? Keanu Reeves has like what, two lines in those movies? But for some <laughs> reason that, that character is such a great character. And you can, you can point to any character. Like the reason you like Jurassic Park, they had great characters. The dinosaurs were cool too. That was the fascination. But yeah. they had a real cool story there. Michael Crichton who wrote, you know, Michael, you ever heard of Michael Crichton? You know who he is? Me? Oh, yeah. yeah. I've read yeah. all of his books. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah, Michael Crichton wrote Jurassic Park. In fact, it's funny. His stories are all about amusement parks that go bad. Westworld, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. um, um, but he... He was like six foot nine. Did you know that? He was like a very tall dude. But, uh, what? Isn't that crazy? Like, and Spielberg is so short. So I can just imagine them <laughs> working together. Stephen would be like this the whole time. I know. But it all comes down to great storytelling. So yeah, we were able to, to build um, a, uh, a roster of characters that people really loved. And then what story do we... And, and by the way, on and TV, you're on a week to week schedule. We need a story today. Who's the character we haven't touched for a while? Mr. Crocker. Okay, he's funny. What do we do about him? Um, uh, he wants to get Timmy's fairies and there's a big dance coming out, whatever. Okay, that's funny, you know, or Tim. Well, I know, how about one of the fairies uh, bonks his head, forgets who he is, and Mr. Crocker thinks he's his son. That's funny, you know, let's do that. So mm -hmm. that sort of stuff. So you're kind of going at a rapid pace, I'm sure as you are as well. Yeah, so when you were growing up, did you have a favorite cartoon that inspired you? You tell me what your favorite cartoon was growing up, then I'll tell you mine and I'll, I'll tell you why. Well, cool, my favorite cartoon, wow. Uh, so many great ones. Uh, I used to love um, Speed Racer. Those mm -hmm. were my favorite ones. Speed Racer was one of the first anime cartoons. And I really loved uh, the Flintstones. I'm Again, the Flintstones, even though people might watch it now, that's so boring. But the characters were so great in the Flintstones. I used to love that show. Yeah. No, I've I, I seen many 
of the Flintstones episodes when I was much younger. Yeah, you're right. Again, a, a character thing. Uh, for, for me, it was definitely Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles growing mm. up. Like that hit me at like that perfect age. I already liked turtles to begin with. So now that there was like a cartoon about turtles, I didn't really understand like the fighting stuff at first. But, you know, the one I got into it again, it was that uniqueness of the characters and the team dynamic that they created. Um, they sort of almost worked like a sports team in many instances. And I just really saw that similarity between so many other things that I was into in my life. I like Ninja Turtles. I like basketball. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that. You know, and then, of course, the success story behind Ninja Turtles, I'm sure, is very similar to some of the things that you've gone through, where it's just just amazing that some things can have such a run like that over a decade in popularity and span multiple generations, which is pretty awesome. Trust me, everybody in animation wishes they had thought of the Ninja Turtles. Trust me, we all, we all wish we'd thought of that because there's so many iterations. And it's all it comes out of the merchandising, too. As a, yeah. as a creator, you want to see your stuff turned into things like this. You know, you want to see... Right. Uh, this is a doll of a cartoon I created on YouTube uh, called The Hobby Kids, which is a great cartoon. But um, nice. yeah, but uh, you want to see merchandise made out of your stuff too. And I'm sure you do as well. And I, what I love about you is that you proved to the people that said no, that, oh, no, no there's a yes here. We can make this as a show. Now you have a show. You know, you have your own show. You've proven you could do it. So I, I would like to tell people and inspire them that don't take no for an answer. Just find a way around the no. I have a book coming out. It's all about pitching shows in Hollywood. And I talk about oh, cool. that book too. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, man. So anything else? No, I think, I mean, I think that's good. I probably could ask a gazillion questions, but I know there's only a, a certain limit to how long you can necessarily upload things on YouTube and people actually still watch them. I know. So. If anybody's still around, thanks for watching. And uh, yeah. I know, dude, I know you probably go, got to go out and get stung by something right now. So okay. <laughs> no, uh, I got another phone call in a little bit, but now this was, this was fantastic. Really enjoyed the conversation. Dude, I did too. I can't thank you enough. I'm very honored you came on. Thank you so much, dude. I will be watching. We'll put a link to your video, a link to your channel. Not that you need it from us. Oh, what can I, and why, what can I draw for you by the way oh um i went through something for the guests at the end so you want me to draw you a bug you want me to draw you a, a, a i could draw you as a bug i could draw you as a fairly odd parent i could draw uh, whatever you want well how about since this is something that i don't necessarily ever want to be bitten by but we we talked about as being like this big build-up that we're heading towards in the future how about me getting chomped on the arm by a komodo dragon whoa all right and hopefully that will not be the scenario that happens because I do not want to be bitten by one of these oh, things. Oh, dude, I hope not. Um, what are they, <laughs> where, where are the Komodo dragons, by the way? Uh, off the in Indonesian islands, specifically Komodo Island and its surrounding islands are where the dragons are found. And they really are dinosaurs, aren't they? They're pretty much a dinosaur. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, pretty good. much. Wow, amazing. Dude, thank you so much, Coyote. Uh, I appreciate it, man. I'd love to do it again sometime if you're open for it. Yeah, let me know anytime. And maybe next time we'll get more into uh, the the influences of, of animation entertainment. I love getting to talk about uh, the creative process and how things come to fruition. So that could be a good subject matter for us to go back and forth on YouTube videos physically produced in the field versus uh, the idea of things being produced in the studio on paper or smart pads to create cartoons. And whatnot. I think we should develop a show for you and we could talk about it on zoom here and want to have the audience watch the process. That'd be kind of fun. Hey, I would be, I'd be all game for talking about actually doing a show together, man. You're, you're one of the legends. So no, could, okay. I'm, I, you are, sweet. Uh, been an honor. Thank you, my man. Have a great rest of your day. Please stay safe out there. Okay. I'll do my best. Thanks so much for having me, Butch. All right, buddy. Thanks, Cody. See you later. Take care. Bye. Man, did you guys feel uh, your body getting sweaty as you were talking to Coyote Peterson? Just talking about putting those creatures near your body and having them, allowing them to sting you, and and wow, I what a champion. That guy is awesome. Again, go check out his channel. We're putting a link below, of course. And uh, Coyote, thank you for coming on, man. I am just honored that you came on. Thank you so much. I learned so much about, not just the fact that he's into doing all this wild nature stuff, but he's a storyteller as well. He loves to craft stories and videos in a way that's super professional. I'm very, very um, impressed by his channel. So, Coyote, way to go, man. Uh, really great uh, talking to you. And uh, I think we're friends. We, we think we're friends now, him and I? Oh, you're the best friend. Uh, yeah. Whoa. And, and Wally, we're, yeah. Well, speaking of best friends. Yay, buddy. Okay. So, uh, keep him over there. Hey, you know, uh, Coyote wants me to draw him a picture of him getting bitten by a Komodo dragon. Before Wally comes back, let's do this. Okay, welcome to the drawing area of my very safe studio that's inside without any bugs or, oh boy, there, 
Hey, Wally. Okay, so I'm now gonna draw something for Coyote Peterson. You heard him, he wants me to draw him getting bitten in the arm by a Komodo dragon. Okay, I've looked up what a Komodo dragon looks like, and I got a picture of Coyote over here, so I'm gonna do my best to make this happen. Again, I'm just drawing freehand here, no rough sketch underneath, just my little brain and my little pen. Again, all you guys need to draw is a giant pad of newsprint and a marker. You don't need very expensive materials to start with. You don't need to be a millionaire to become an artist. So learn with the basics. Okay, here we go. So, uh, Mr. Peterson, so I should probably make him, I think screaming in pain, I guess with his, you know, because the, the Komodo dragon is getting, you know, a piece of his arm. So let's see here. So. Uh, we'll do them like in a fairly odd parent style. How about that? Let's see. So here we go. I'm having to plan this drawing out in my head before I even, even uh, draw anything. So I'll make him screaming. There's his mouth. Ugh. Okay, here's his eyes. All right. I'm sure his eyes will be crossed with pain. Yeah! He's got this cool uh, kind of crocodile Dundee sort of hat on here. Really kind of fun. I gotta tell you, I gotta really hand it this guy, man. I don't even know how I would even come close to these animals, much less putting them on my arm or any other body part and letting them sting me. I don't know what I would do. Right, would you guys ever wanna get stung? Would you guys be brave enough to do that? Let me know down in the comment section if you would and uh, we'll go from there. All right, so there he is. He's got this manly beard going on here, some manly beard stuff. I mean, come on, he's out in the wild. You don't have time to shave. You don't have time to shave. I'm too busy hunting bugs to have them bite me. Am I right? Am I right? Okay, there we go. So there he is. Now the, the Komodo dragon will be up here. Okay, here's his big sharp teeth. All right, can we see this? See it all coming together? Uh, Okay, and there's his little Komodo dragon eyes. Isn't he cute? He's a cute Komodo dragon. I sound like Jerry Seinfeld. He's a Komodo dragon. All right, there we go. Okay, there's his arm, and his arm is in uh, extreme pain here. Yeah. Now let's draw the teeth on the other side of the arm like this. Again, just plotting all this out in my head. I'm sort of laying it out as I go. I'll normally do a drawing like this. It's this involved with a rough sketch, but I didn't have a chance right now. So this is as painful as I get, is watching how painful my drawings are. You know what I mean? There's a Komodo dragon picture. Boy, those things are so scary. Okay. And there you go. Coyote Peterson getting bitten by a Komodo dragon. Let me just sign it down here. And I guarantee you, this is as close as I will ever get to a Komodo dragon right here. All right, uh, thanks very much guys for watching. Coyote, I can't thank you enough for coming on. You are awesome, dude. You're the best. Thank you for coming on to Tuna and uh, letting me interview you. I would love to do more with you. Let's collab on something else. Maybe I'll even go on an adventure with you Maybe I'll put something on my arm. I don't even know. Maybe I'll, put, I'll allow a bug to crawl upon me if, if, you, uh, if you let me do that. That'd be kind of fun. All right, guys. And we can animate it afterwards. We can do a cartoon about it after that. So that'd be kind of cool. All right. Well, I know, here, wait. Here's the idea. I got it. I draw an animal and then uh, well, before I get stung, then I get stung by the animal. My arm goes numb. And then I see if I can draw the animal with the numb arm. There you go. That's How about that, Mr. Cameraman? That would get a lot of views. That would get a lot of views. Whoa, hey. And Wally likes it too. Thanks, Wally. All right, guys. Thanks so much for watching. I really appreciate it. Don't forget to like and subscribe and all that fun stuff. And hey, who else should I have on Tuna? I love Coyote Peterson. What other YouTubers should I have on? What other celebrities should I have on? Let me know down in the comment section. And what didn't I ask Coyote that I should have asked? What do you think I should have asked? Let me know. All right, guys. Thanks so much for watching. I appreciate it. Remember, art gives you power. Use it wisely. Hey, Heart fans, subscribe here to keep up with me, Danny, Timmy, Dudley, Bunsen, and the Noob Network, my new app full of cartoons, shows, and games. Download it here. Click over here to watch my most recent video and here to start a playlist related to this video. Whoa, check out that awesome fan art. To be featured here, use hashtag HeartFanArt and tag me. I'm on every social media platform known to man. Cartoon Butch out. Pencil drop.